Good morning, everybody. So we're in a series, just a quick little two-week series. As you guys know, a couple of weeks ago, we led a trip. It was the Basics with Beth cruise. Just the thought of that, who thinks sounds good? <laughs> if we ever do another one, we'll let you know. So what we did is we took a cruise to the footsteps of Jesus and the footsteps of the Apostle Paul, and it was kind of a serendipity how it even all came about. But in the process, 46 VFCers went to the Holy Land, and we had quite a life-changing experience. Last week, we shared with you the footsteps of Jesus in Israel, and today I'm going to share with you the footsteps of the Apostle Paul in a variety of places as he launched into what we now have is the New Testament. But the reason for doing it, well, a couple reasons. One, it's fresh, and we thought, you know, we're getting back, and we know a lot of folks, you know, for a lot of reasons, maybe they don't even like to travel, or they're not in the season they can do this. But for a lot of people, they would love to take a trip like this. Maybe it's on your bucket list, but it may not happen right away. So why not just take you with us virtually, share a couple of scriptures, we'll share some kind of homemade, eclectic videos, and, uh, and journey together. And part of the premise is, as we're coming up on the holiday season, you know, this is a good reminder to go back and go, yeah, let's remember what all happened. Why did this all happen? This baby Jesus, born in a manger in Bethlehem, lives a sinless life, carries his cross down the Via Della Rosa, which we talked about last week, goes to the cross is crucified, sheds his blood for you and I, and then three days later, God raises him from the dead so that we could have new life. I mean, like, all of that happened in a real place on planet Earth, a place you can go and kick the dust, where Jesus walked, where the Apostle Paul walked. And it's important, you know, in the midst of all the hustle bustle, in the midst of a lot of other things we teach here and try to impart into you guys, sometimes it's just good to take a little historical journey and allow the Holy Spirit to connect dots for us concerning a, several places on planet Earth, connected to the Word, and then connected to our hearts. Like, how is this relevant to us today? So, this is part two, the Apostle Paul's footsteps. We're going to get into it. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us. Father, thank you so much for this good morning in your house. Lord, thank you for your presence. Thank you for the refreshing. Thank you for the water baptisms today. Lord, to be partnered with you, to be doing kingdom business, eternal stuff is amazing. And that you humbled yourself and became a man and came to the planet you created to a place in the Middle East is also amazing. And Lord, we don't take it lightly. We don't just pass by it, but today, we ask you, Holy Spirit, to help us see some things we've never seen, connect some dots for us. Lord, help draw us closer to you and help put in us that strength and the encouragement we need to continue to live our lives for you. And we thank you, God, as we're approaching the holidays, that you'll just stir us up and you'll remind us of the things that are important. We thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody that agreed said? Amen. Amen. All right, so I'm going to show you guys some maps again and just give you a reference point, because I don't know if you were like me, but I didn't pay a lot of attention in geography <laughs> class. Anybody else? <laughs> ah, I know where Michigan is. All right. <laughs> so two parts today. On this journey, we went to several islands that the Apostle Paul stopped at, as well as the big seaport. So it's two parts, the islands of Cyprus, Rhodes and Sicily. I'll give you a quick little hopscotch to those islands, and I'll show you a short little video from the trip. And then we're going to talk about the seaports because the Apostle Paul was also very strategic. He went to the major seaports for trade and commerce and influence and where people were, and those were Athens, Corinth, Ephesus, and Rome. He went to other places, but those are four that we went to, and we're going to talk about those different places. On this map, if you'll go ahead and take a look. So Rome was where we started. We went south to Sicily. And then we went all the way over to Israel, to Jerusalem. And then we went up to Cyprus, and then to Rhodes, and then to Ephesus, then to Athens, then to Corinth, and then back to Rome. That was our route. Now, the Apostle Paul's route was a little different in terms of which direction he went. but. Just to give you the reference point, this here 
where Ephesus is, is Turkey, modern day Turkey. Galatia is what it was known. So the letter to the Galatians, you might remember. Down here is Israel, Syria, Lebanon. Over here is Greece, and of course, Italy. So this Mediterranean Sea route, some things happened here. We're going to talk about it as well and um, kind of take you guys on the journey, okay? So let's start with the islands. Let's just talk about the islands. And first, we'll look at the Apostle Paul. Who was he? Because next to Jesus, he's probably the most widely known person from the Bible and possibly the most influential outside of Jesus. All the disciples, King David, Moses, Abraham, everybody had their influence, but the Apostle Paul wrote over half of the New Testament, so we know him the best, and his impact on the church, the thing that you and I are a part of, is significant. So here's his story, Acts 26, verse 12. We'll just read a little bit of this. And again, I'm going to kind of go fast because I've got lots of scriptures we're not going to get to, but I want you guys to get this bird's eye view and have some of the dots connect. The Apostle Paul said, one day I was on such a mission to Damascus, armed with the authority and commission of the leading priests. About noon, your majesty, as I was on the road, a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shone down on me and my companions. We all fell down, and I heard a voice say to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is useless for you to fight against my will. Who are you, Lord? I asked. And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Which is so interesting. Paul was persecuting the church. Jesus had resurrected, you know. Paul was persecuting the church, Christians. And Jesus was taking that personally. He said, you're persecuting me. My church is my body. A little side thought. It is useless for you to fight against me. Uh, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get to your feet, for I have appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and witness. Tell the people that you've seen me and tell them what I will show you in the future. And I will rescue you from both your own people and the Gentiles. Yes, I'm sending you to the Gentiles. That would be the non-Jews. All of us would probably fall in the Gentile category to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, then they will receive forgiveness of, for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. So this is his calling. And what's so interesting about Paul, and I think very strategic about God and may even resonate with you, is the apostle Paul was a Pharisee. He was a Jew. He was like born of the tribe of Benjamin, taught by all the scholars, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And yet... He didn't even live in Israel. He lived in Tarsus, Saul of Tarsus, which was a Greek area. So he was very steeped in the Greek culture. He got the culture of what the world was that day. And yet he was Jewish. He was, like I said, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, very trained, very educated. And it's just so interesting that God used his background being so, you know, relevant to his culture, the culture of the world that day, with his religious upbringing to say, yep, you're the one I'm calling. You're the one I'm calling to go to the Gentiles to preach the gospel to them. He also went to synagogues and preached to the Jews. But God has a way of doing that, y'all. God has a way of layering your background. <clears throat> and, and you might think none of this is connected. This all feels disconnected. The Lord has a way of taking the pieces of our lives and our experience, and he layers them together, stacks them together to then use those things for his purposes, which we definitely see with the Apostle Paul. Isn't that cool? So then let's start. <clears throat> First little pit stop here, Cyprus. Cyprus is a little island uh, north of Israel, um, and it's beautiful. Some of you maybe have heard of Cyprus, but he went two places there. There's not a lot in the Bible about Cyprus, but in Acts 13, we get a little taste. Acts 13, verse 1. Now, in the church that was in Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, separate to me Barnabas and Saul. That's Paul. His name had not changed yet. For the work to which I have called them. They fasted and prayed, laid hands on them. And they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. And from there, they sailed to Cyprus. And then they arrived at Salamis, which is a city in Cyprus. They preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. Now, when they had gone through the island to Paphos, another city on Cyprus, 
they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul. This is the governor of Paphos on the island of Cyprus. Okay, now this is an area we went to. You'll see some video clips in just a minute. This is the governor, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word. He'd heard about this Jesus, wanted to hear it from Paul. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, Oh, you full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, you will not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord. And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind and seeing not the sun for a time. A temporary blindness came on this guy. Immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Now verse 12 was the whole goal. Then the proconsul, which is the governor or the leader, believed. Then the leader believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So this guy got saved, a leader in the island. We don't know for sure what happened, but there's a good chance when an influencer gets saved, something happens on the island. And something needed to happen on this island because in the whole um, Greek islands and all the, really all those different areas of what was then Greece, there had been a lot of Roman influence as well. They were huge idol worshipers. We saw that clear as a bell on this trip. So many temples made to idols, made to gods and goddesses. Mythology ran rampant. And the goddess that really dominated this area and many others, actually, Athens and Corinth, was the goddess Aphrodite, the god of sensual pleasure, the goddess of sensual pleasure. Now, the crazy thing, I think this is crazy. The crazy thing is, here's how she came to exist in their mythology. The love goddess, Aphrodite, was said to have emerged from the foam of the sea, generated when her father Uranus was castrated and his privates were thrown into the sea by his son Titan. Dysfunctional family. <laughs> and that from the foam of the sea, Aphrodite emerged. Now, Aphrodite is also called Venus. Some of you from the 70s might remember the song. Venus was her name. It's about this goddess that they worshiped in Cyprus and Corinth and Athens and many other places, temples to Aphrodite. I mean, massive, huge temples. And at these places, what would happen is the sailors would come in because the only form of travel was really by ship. We didn't have airplanes. We didn't have a lot of cars, let's say. So the only way to really travel was by ship. And the sailors would come into these different ports, and they would look for sexual pleasure. And there were temple prostitutes. They called it sacred prostitution to worship Aphrodite. And in fact, we'll get to Corinth in a minute. But in Corinth, historians say, many historians say, there is record of a thousand temple prostitutes that were at the temple of Aphrodite in Corinth. Well, there was a temple for Aphrodite and many small temples in Cyprus as well. They worshiped idols and lots of shrines and temples and lots of man-made gods, which is why Paul, you'll see, gets so passionate about preaching in all of these places, all right? Let's now go to Rhodes real quick. Rhodes is another beautiful little island, not too far. We have one reference to Rhodes in Acts 21. After saying farewell to the Ephesian leaders, elders, we sailed straight to the island of Kaz. The next day we reached Rhodes, and then we went to Patera. There we boarded a ship for Phoenicia. We sighted the island of Cyprus, passed it on our left, and landed at the harbor of Tyre in Syria to unload the cargo. Now, a lot of times when you read the Bible, at least for me, I don't really pay attention to all these little details, these ports and these cities. But of course, when you're going there, you do pay attention. And you're like, this is wild. I mean, within, you know, a couple of 100 yards of where we are on the sea or where we got off at a certain port, you can kind of go back in time and think, man, the apostle Paul was here. Like he walked these places preaching hundreds of years ago. So in Rhodes, the only real record they have is they have an area where they believe he would have ported in Rhodes 
because of getting out of the wind and the safety for boats and so on. They've actually named it St. Paul's Bay. You'll see that in the video. It's a beautiful island, very, very friendly people. We had a really fun Greek guide who was awesome. You'll see a little bit of him. And then Sicily. On the way to Rome, the Apostle Paul was being taken to Rome in a different journey. He was on the Mediterranean Sea, and they came upon a massive storm. This was Acts chapter 27. They came upon a massive storm. I mean, this ship that he was on carried 200 and some men, so it was a big ship. They came upon a storm. The Bible says they didn't see the sun or the moon for 14 days. They had feared for their lives. They were giving up. All was lost. The tiny ship was tossed. <laughs> And one night, the Bible says, the angel of the Lord appeared to the Apostle Paul. He's a prisoner on the ship. One night, the angel of the Lord appeared to the Apostle Paul and said, Paul, you're going to be fine. You and all the men with you will be fine. You're going to get to Rome because you need to preach there. So they're in the midst of a storm. They're throwing cargo overboard. They're getting rid of their little dinghy. I mean, they're just getting all kinds of stuff freed to try to survive. And he says the next morning to everybody on the ship, he says, I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. We're going to make it. We're going to be okay. Well, they kept going. They ended up sort of hitting some coral or hit the shore, and the boat began to break into pieces, and some of the people started to try to escape. And Paul said, no, everybody stick together. The Lord said, we got to stick together, and we'll all make it. They grabbed pieces of wood in the ocean, and they floated into a little city or a little island called Malta. They all survived. They were there for a couple of months, and then they got on a different ship and sailed up to Sicily and landed in Syracuse. We were in a little town about 45 minutes from Syracuse is where we were, a beautiful little town in Italy, and uh, you'll see some pictures of that. But the encouragement, and I was encouraging the group on the ship, I said, you guys, let's not miss the moment. Let's not miss where we are. I mean, I don't know how many people in all of history get to be in this sort of spot on the Mediterranean on a ship, but the Apostle Paul was. And I don't know how many football fields away he would have traveled from where we are right now, but it had to be pretty close because he landed at Sicily, and so are we. And let's not miss the moment, and let's be reminded that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and the same Jesus that appeared to him one night in the middle of a storm to give him an anchor word is the same Jesus that does that for you and I. You might be in a storm right now, and you're not on the Mediterranean, but listen, the same Jesus that appeared to the Apostle Paul and gave him a word is the same one by the power of his Holy Spirit that will speak to us with a still, small voice when the waves are crashing in on our lives and we feel like we're swamped. God will give us a still, small voice, a word of encouragement. And he still had to deal with the storm, but he said, I believe God. I believe God. I believe God. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what the doctors say. I don't care what the wind says. I don't care what the waves say. I don't care what my bank account says. I believe God. I believe God. I believe God. Amen. That it shall be, even as it was told me. And as we come up on the holidays, man, let me encourage you. Let's hear from God. Let's hear from God for this last year, but let's hear from God and get a fresh word for the new year. I believe God. And of course, like I said, it all happened just as they were told for the Apostle Paul. All right, watch this quick little video. It's about three and a half minutes, but I want you to see just a taste. Picture yourself in these spots with the Apostle Paul. All right, let's watch it. It's homegrown, remember. No volume. Day two is today. Day three is tomorrow. Yeah. Day four is next day. That's yeah. right. So the next day. Yep, that's, that's right. So that, Riveting. that day, which we... Just to give you guys a picture of the group, some of the folks helped us read Bible scriptures and kind of paint the picture. Please celebrate this renewal. Yes, let me get out of the picture. <laughs> surprise one night.
I like those hats. Just to give you guys a little picture of the, the group. This is Cyprus. Paphos. That was their carpet back in the day, mosaics. This is Rhodes. He stopped at Lindos. Greg Gustin had his own car. Wow. <laughs> we did a little tour with Greg and Vicky and our Greek guide. This was the Bay of St. Paul. That's where he would have ported. How I save you is that you pay you win 12 euros of the entrance to get in. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Save us. Spend it. Of course, we have plenty of time if you want to walk up. It's not a... Okay. <laughs> what about you guys? Well, it's just stones out. You can't grow much. That's why they don't have even so many olives. Even if they grow, they are not so successful. So, these people, they could make their living just on the sea. That's Lindos now. We will have two clays with some animal. The red clay, we make the plates, the Rodian art, so it's more strong. Okay? Have a look. These are like medieval castles and walls and churches, all of that inroads. Sicily. Very, very pretty. <laughs> I think they had the best cannolis at this place. Not that anybody's hungry at the moment. April and her mother. Woo! Pastor Richard. Greg and Vicky. That's a, that's a theater in that particular place. Back to the ship. Right there on those waters, the Apostle Paul was. So there's a little quick snapshot for you of those islands, all right? So do you feel like you were there for two seconds? Yeah. All right, good. Now let's talk about these four seaports. And again, we're just going to hit the high points. But this is Athens, Corinth, Ephesus, and Rome. Here's the map again. They'll put it up, and you can just see where they are in reference to one another. So we're going to start with Athens, then Paul went to Corinth, then he went to Ephesus, and eventually he made it to Rome, and he circled around there. All those arrows on this particular map are pictures of his four missionary journeys, three missionary journeys and a trip to Rome. So we'll start with Athens. Can you guys see that right there in the middle? And Corinth is just a bit south of that. All right, let's look at what happened in Athens. Acts 17, in verse 16, I'll just, like I said, kind of hit the high points, but while Paul was waiting for his companions in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all the idols he saw everywhere in the city. He went into the synagogue to reason with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles. He spoke daily in the public square to all who happened to be there. He also had a debate with some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. When he told them about Jesus and his resurrection, they said, what is this babbler trying to say with these strange ideas he's picked up? Others said, he seems to be preaching about some foreign gods. Then they took him to the high council of the city. That's called Mars Hill in a lot of Bibles um, as well. And over there it's called Mars Hill. Come and tell us about this new teaching, they said. You are saying some rather strange things. We want to know what it's all about. It should be explained that all of the Athenians, as well as the foreigners in Athens, seem to spend all their time discussing the latest ideas. So Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows. Men of Athens, I noticed that you are very religious in every way. For as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines, and one of your altars had this inscription on it, to an unknown God. 
This God, whom you worship without knowing, is the one I'm telling you about. Verse 24. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples. Now, we just read that and think, yeah, that's right, Paul. But this was a huge statement because everything in the Greek world was man-made temples. There were so many temples to Aphrodite, to Artemis we'll hear about in just a minute, to Zeus, to Apollo. There were so many temples, man-made temples, and they were worshiping all of these gods. That's why when Paul got to Athens, his spirit was troubled. He looked around and just saw all of this idol worship, and it stirred him up. So he goes to Mars Hill, the place, it sort of was their internet of the day. They didn't have internet. They didn't have television. This is where you went to get the news. This is where you went to talk about ideas, to learn more about education and philosophy and religion and all the stuff. Mars Hill is just maybe a hundred yards lower than what is known as the Acropolis. The Acropolis in Athens, I'm sure you've seen pictures and you'll see some in a minute, is the highest point in Athens. The Acropolis means the highest point in a city. And it was there they had built so many temples. You maybe have heard of the Pantheon, the Parthenon. There's one in Rome and there's one here in Athens that was a place to worship all these man-made gods. There were temples to Zeus. I mean, there were just so many temples all over Athens, but at the very top on the Acropolis. Mars Hill was just maybe 100 yards below that, and that was where people went to get the news of the day. And that was where Paul began to debate with the Epicureans and the Stoics the philosophers of the day. The Epicureans, for you and I, the Epicureans would be the, if it feels good, do it. Go with your feelings, man. Whatever feels good, whatever works for you. That was that mindset. The Epicureans were all about feelings, all about sensual pleasure, all about pleasure. The Stoics, which you can sort of figure out just by these words, the Stoics were much more heady. Everything had to be rational and logical and not emotional no emotion, logic, and rational thinking. So Paul begins to preach the gospel to these people, which is not unlike the culture we're in, right? We have Epicureans and Stoics, just like they did, in all of the different spheres of influence we have on the internet, I mean, all over the place, the same basic ways of thinking. And Paul began to preach the gospel to them. And I love what it says. Let's keep reading. Uh, Verse 25 Um, God does not live in man-made temples, and human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need. And then jump down to verse uh, 28. For in him we live and move and exist, as some of your own poets have said. We are his offspring. And since this is true, we shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen from gold or silver or stone. God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times, but now he commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and turn to him. Then Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. We'll go to Corinth in a minute. But I love what the Apostle Paul did. He was so good at this. He found common ground. He said, hey, I see y'all love to worship. That's amazing. And I've noticed you worship this thing called the unknown God. Well, let me tell you about the unknown God because I know him. He's not made in man-made temples. And he goes on to describe and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. But then I love what he did. He's so brilliant. We do our best around here to try to employ some of these spirit-led methods. But he used a poet of the day. He used one of their lyrics writers of the day. In him we live and move and have our being, even as one of your own poets has said. Even as one of the guys you listen to on the radio has said. Even as one of the celebrities has said. He used the poets of the day and said, we are his offspring. That's what your your people say. These are their lyrics. So I'm going to take their lyrics and I'm going to preach the gospel to you in a language you understand. The Apostle Paul always said, I have become all things to all men so that by all means I might bring them to Christ. I'll tell you what, I love that. And just being there and thinking about him on Mars Hill and how brilliant it was stirred me up and all of us up to be like, okay, Lord, back in our spheres of influence, back at our Thanksgiving tables this Thursday, back in our homes, God help us to be the kinds of Christians that find common ground. He was very complimentary 
of them at the beginning just to build some rapport. And then he found out what questions were they asking. He's listening between the lines. What do they need to hear? He preaches the gospel to them using the lyrics of the day. And that ultimately gives them the gospel. Amen. So we can be encouraged by what the Apostle Paul did, even in our own worlds today. All right, he went to Corinth. Let's buzz over to Corinth. 1 Corinthians 1, just, it's just a few miles south of Athens. Paul then wrote the letter to the Corinthians. He actually wrote the letter to the Corinthians from Ephesus, which we're going to in just a minute. He said, I am writing to God's church in Corinth. To you who have been called by God to be his own people, he made you holy by the means of Christ Jesus, just as he did for all people everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, theirs and ours. Chapter 2, verse 1. When I first came to you, Corinthians, I didn't use lofty words and impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. For I decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, timid and trembling. Well, it makes sense because he's coming in to upend their culture. It wasn't just like a nice little religious message. He was coming in to upend the culture. They had built such incredible temples. They, in Ephesus, it was one of the seven wonders of the world. These temples to man-made gods. The idol worship was so dominant. When he comes in saying, we don't worship gods made with hands. We worship the living God. That wasn't like, so just sort of change your thinking, y'all. It was like, no, we need to tear down high places. No, we need to make a radical change. And it went over really well with some people, and it went over really bad with a lot of others. And the Apostle Paul, as you guys know, experienced so much persecution, stoned and beat and shipwrecked. I mean, it makes sense now why in the world he went through so much, because this was a radical message of God's love and God's reality to people that had bought into Aphrodite came out of the foam of the sea and we're building temples to her and we're worshiping her whole cities whole regions and they're making a lot of money doing it too that's Ephesus we'll get there the temple in Corinth at the Acropolis there uh, is where they say historians say there was a thousand temple prostitutes they called it sacred worship and the sailors would come in and it was just a big old perverse party and Paul walked into that city and said, I came with weakness and in fear and in much trembling. I decided not to know anything among you except Christ and him crucified. I came not with lofty words of men's wisdom, but in a demonstration of the spirit and his power. Amen. Isn't it interesting? He wrote 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13, the wedding chapter. But isn't it interesting? He wrote it to the Corinthians, a place that was worshiping Aphrodite. He was trying to explain to them, hey, this is what real love is. Y'all are very seduced by this Aphrodite goddess, but let me tell you what real love is. Like the context of so many things in the letters to the Corinthians makes more sense when you realize what Paul's up against. But listen, it's no different for you and I. Not much has changed. There's nothing new under the sun. Only the names change. <laughs> And all the people said. Okay, that's Corinth, Ephesus. Let's buzz over to Ephesus. I've got four minutes to get you to Ephesus and Rome because i got to show you the video. Okay, Acts 19, what happened in Ephesus besides a million things? Ephesus was one of the strongest churches. The letter to the Ephesians tells you it was a very mature church. Timothy was the pastor of the church in Ephesus. The apostle Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesians, our, our book of, F, of, of Ephesians, from Rome, which we're going to next. This was a great church, but they worshiped not Aphrodite, they worshiped Artemis. Artemis was a female goddess, also called Diana. So you had Aphrodite called Venus, but this is Artemis called Diana. And the Apostle Paul, in Acts 19, we won't read it, but in Acts 19, a lot happened. One major thing happened is he came there and said, hey, have you all heard about the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they said, we haven't even heard there is a Holy Spirit. And he laid hands on 
many of them in the Ephesians church and they got filled with the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues, magnified God, had the power of God in their lives in Ephesus. He's preaching the gospel and there's a stadium there, a theater. It seats 25,000. How much, what does Waldo seat? Is that about right? Does Waldo Stadium seat about 25? 30. So it's close to that size of Waldo, maybe just a little smaller. You'll see a picture of it. This is a stadium they built back in the day, a theater. Seats around 25,000. In Ephesus proper, there was around 250,000 people to give you the picture. It's in Turkey. It was a seaport city. Now it's eight miles inland because the silt has built up. It's eight miles inland, and they've only excavated about 18% of it. But in this theater one day, there's a riot because of the gospel. Because the Apostle Paul's preaching the gospel, there's literally a riot in the theater. Anyways, the Apostle Paul was not to be detoured. He stayed in Ephesus for two and a half, almost three years, teaching the word in what's called the, what the first Bible school, the school of Tyrannus. And the Bible says that all of Asia heard the word. What was happening in Ephesus was spreading to the whole Asian world at that time, teaching the word in a Bible school in Ephesus. You guys will see some pictures of that, okay? That's Ephesus. Now, let's go to Rome. Paul eventually got to Rome, which is where he was martyred. He wrote the book of Romans from Corinth. He was martyred in Rome, beheaded and he was in prison there a couple times, and several things happened in Rome. But Romans 1, verse 15, So I'm eager to come to you in Rome to preach the good news. I'm not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. That's you and me. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Paul was preaching to the Gentiles in Rome, and he's like, guys, listen, it's not about you all keeping the Ten Commandments. It's about believing in Jesus, and then you'll be empowered to keep the Ten Commandments. In Romans 5.17, he said, For if by the trespass of one man death reigned through that one man Adam, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ. The whole book of Romans is about believing in Jesus by faith, being made the righteousness of God in Christ, and reigning in life, being an overcomer through your faith. What could separate you from the love of God? Nothing. Why? Because you have faith in Jesus, and the just shall live by faith. He's preaching a message, again, upending the culture because it was all about worship and it was all about works and it was all about obeying Rome. It was all about a lot of other things. And he comes in talking about faith in Jesus makes you righteous. It was a radical message. And Nero ultimately didn't like it. But here's what the Apostle Paul said. I'll end with this and then we're gonna watch the video. Romans 10, I love this because this was his message. This is our message. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. It is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? The apostle Paul knew they can't. That's why I must go. And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? They can't. And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? They can't. That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring the good news. The apostle Paul got so many miles in preaching the good news all throughout the Greek era, area, all throughout the Roman area. And at the time, that was the center of everything happening on planet Earth. He was very strategic in getting the gospel to those folks, writing the letters to the churches, so that 2,000 years later, here we are in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Isn't this the craziest thing? Here we are 2,000 years later, reading letters the Apostle Paul wrote on these journeys so that we can know the same God and be made righteous by faith in Jesus. It's pretty amazing. Watch this video clip. 
We're all ready for a rainy day in Athens. We've got our ponchos, waiting to get on our bus. Hey. What a sight. Mars Hill, looking up to the Acropolis. These are all the temples on top of the Acropolis. Ancient, it's an ancient theater. Well, this is where you said. That's where the temple of Aphrodite was on top of that hill. Temple of Apollo. Had a golden uh, statue of him in that, they say. The judgment seat is a reference to the judgment seat of Christ there in Corinth. Ephesus, Turkey. He spent his life excavating Ephesus. That's what the Main Street excavations are looking like. It's pretty amazing. That was all underground. They've uncovered it and put pillars back on top of each other. <laughs> yep. There's that theater, 25,000. Amazing. That was the temple of Artemis, one of the gods in Ephesus. There's the one they worshiped. They found that little statue in the ruins. Taught the word, everybody heard it.
Colosseum and the Roman Forum area. That is an amazing piece of architecture, isn't it? Inside the Colosseum, of course, it would have had a roof on it and a floor, but this is the ruins. <laughs> Good job. Would have had stadium seating overhead, so all that stadium seating is gone. But picture an arena these days. I mean, this was an arena from back in the day. Old Rome. <laughs> the Roman Forum. So Paul would have walked in this area and meeting with people and preaching and there's lots of historic stuff from that era. His prison is straight ahead at 12 o'clock right now, at 12 o'clock where that tower is. That's the prison where Paul spent some time. The Vatican? The Vatican, though. Priceless art throughout this place. This is just one hallway, but it's worth seeing if you're over there. You'll see the um, statue of Artemis in just a minute that they worshipped. Point it out. It's coming, it's coming. It'll be at 3 o'clock, Artemis. Right there. Sorry, make it 9 o'clock. <laughs> yes, okay. Ancient tapestry. These are all priceless tapestries, but watch the eyes of Jesus in this tapestry. They follow you as you're walking. So in this tapestry, not only Jesus Sistine Chapel. Michelangelo's first painting was the ceiling. St. Peter's Basilica, basically the headquarters of the Catholic Church. That is his magnum opus right there, his greatest work. I left a get a grip book behind those doors a couple years ago. Cardinal Timothy Dolan happened to bump into him, which is cool. Ciao, ciao. That's it.